Okay. So welcome everybody. My name is Duncan Gillard. I'm an educational psychologist working out of uh, Bristol in the UK. I'm also uh, an ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy and DNAV, that's the ACT for Youth Model Trainer, um, Practitioner and um, Supervisor. Um, ACT and DNAV are two of my three kind of main models of choice in my practice and they form a big part of what uh, we're gonna talk about today. So the title of the presentation today is Developing Psychological Flexibility in Education, a Whole School and Systems Approach. Just to provide a quick overview of the session, I'm just gonna move this panel over slightly. What I'm hoping to do in this session with you is in the first instance, explore some of the strengths and in my opinion, importance of using whole school frameworks for supporting the well-being of a school community and for organizing well-being related practices within a school's functioning. I wanna highlight though also the importance of clearly defining well-being within related work in schools. Definitions of well-being within the literature vary enormously and can sometimes, I think it's fair to say, even be somewhat contradictory or at least confusing and don't always sit particularly well together. So it can be hard to clarify the direction of travel that we're trying to move in when we talk about improving psychological well-being of our school communities. So I want to take some time to explore some of those um, challenging but also interesting and important issues. And then I want to make the case that the psychological flexibility model is an example of a coherent way of making sense of mental health, well-being and resilience in human beings, young and uh, adult populations. And based on the view that I personally hold that after about 30 years of work in the world of psychological flexibility, acceptance and commitment therapy, contextual psychological science more generally, we're now at a point in terms of our conceptual and empirical journey such that the notion of psychological flexibility can, can be applied across a wide range of areas of uh, functioning in relation to well-being practices in schools. So that's what I'm hoping to talk about with you today. Session should last something like 35 minutes in total. So I'm gonna start off just by talking through an example of a whole school wellbeing framework. And this is probably the whole school wellbeing framework that I use most in my practice personally. It's the one that I find most personally useful. And so this is the one I'm gonna to bring to bear on the conversation. So I'm kind of gonna introduce it here. And then in the latter part of the presentation, I'm gonna circle back to it and show how, site or attempt at least, to show how psychological flexibility practices can map onto the various different facets of this whole school wellbeing framework. So this framework was developed by Public Health England, found its way into publication first in 2015. And it breaks wellbeing practices within schools into six, sorry, eight <laughs> different segments. The, the, the center piece, if you like, is this leadership and management piece. So practices that support the well-being of leaders and managers within organizations and practices that leaders and managers engage in that support the well-being of their community. And I don't think Public Health England have put this in the center because the well-being of leaders and managers is any more important necessarily than the well-being of the rest of the school community, but rather that, even if they take a relatively, should we say, sociocratic or democratic perspective on how to um, uh, provide management and leadership within their organizations, the executive responsibility to make um, big decisions within schools and other educational settings sits with leaders and managers, including decisions that affect the well-being of their community. So they're in the center of this framework. And then I'm just going to whistle stop tour, if you like, around the other seven different segments of this framework. So up in the top, sort of one o'clock position, if you like, is this piece around curriculum, and teaching and learning. I'd rather like to frame this just ever so slightly differently as universal, proactive and preventative measures that schools can take to support the well-being 
yeah, preventatively of all children and young people within their school community. And that can include curriculums, PSHE curriculums, wellbeing curriculums, resilience curriculums, and so on. But it can also include other things as well. Um, the way the school promotes exercise, promotes uh, yeah, physical activity more generally, the way the school promotes uh, social co uh, connectedness, cooperation, collaboration, challenging themselves, building resilience, those kinds of things. Then we come round to this enabling student voice piece. You know, I think it's fair to say we human beings like to have a say in the things that affect us. We like to have a degree of control and, 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 and to be empowered to make decisions about the things that are important in our lives, the communities to which we belong. And so within this framework, quite rightly, enabling students to have a voice in the things that affect them is an important part. Staff development is the next one round as we go kind of clockwise round the framework. And again, I break this down into two sections, uh, at least really. One which is about supporting the well-being of school staff, teaching staff and non-teaching staff. And the other one is about supporting teaching staff and non-teaching staff to, to promote the well-being of others within the community. Maybe you could argue primarily, but not exclusively, uh, the well-being of the students that they are imposed to support and support the learning and development of. Going around again, uh, clockwise, identifying need and monitoring impact. And this for me is about <clears throat> just really intelligent and functional ways of collecting data and collecting information that shows what we're doing and the impact of what we're doing and for whom. And then around to care, carers and parents, work that supports the well-being of parents and supports the well-being of carers and really inclusive, holistic, community-focused schools do a lot of this work in my experience. And again, I think this has two pieces to it, supporting the well-being of parents and carers, but also supporting parents in practicing in ways that support the well-being of their own children. I think there's room for both in schools functioning and certainly that's again, a, a centerpiece within this framework. And then around to targeted support at that kind of, kind of um, nine o'clock point, I suppose, on the model. So targeted support, including support for groups that have in some sense on assessment shown up as being homogenous in some important way. Maybe it's about social anxiety, maybe it's about uh, low mood, low affect, maybe anger related issues or something like that. So support for targeted groups, and also more specialist one-to-one -one support for, uh, for children and young people who are particularly struggling. And then finally, this piece around an ethos and environment that promotes respect, well-being, and values, diversity. So these are all of the eight different segments of this framework. As I say, we're gonna, we're gonna circle back to this in, in, in a little bit and talk about it in relation to the various different offerings that over the last 30 years have developed within the world of acceptance and commitment therapy, acceptance and commitment training, the DNAV model and uh, allied approaches within the world of contextual um, psychological science. So as I said at the opening piece, from my point of view, these frameworks can be incredibly useful but I also think it's equally as important for a school to find ways of defining well-being in ways that are clear, in ways that are coherent, in ways that feel there's a shared sense of buy into and ownership of. Defining well-being really, really matters. And whilst a framework like that Public Health England framework is really important, for organizing practices, for assessing the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of practices. It doesn't necessarily tell us how as a community or how as groups within a community we might usefully define uh, the term well-being. So I like to think that defining well-being means it needs to be clear, it needs to be coherent, it needs to be shared, and there needs to be a workable definition by which I mean in some sense linked to evidence-based and or evidence-informed practices. And the reason I think, or one of the main reasons I think defining well-being is so important for schools before we start thinking about what practices do we use, 
in order to get there and improve the situation is that a clear, coherent and workable definition of well-being provides the community with a broad trajectory, like a broad direction of travel for its activities around uh, improving well-being for the community members. But defining well-being is a really complex matter, it turns out, um, more complex than, than, than many people realize. Definitions within the literature vary enormously. Um, it's interesting that the more you speak to people who've studied well-being academically, the more you realize just how complex it is. It's almost like the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. It's a really complex area. And in my experience, definitions don't just vary considerably, but sometimes they just don't sit very comfortably with each other, almost like they appear to slightly contradict one another taken to the extreme. I think that's a matter of opinion, but sometimes I notice that. And a big question that shows up when we're thinking about these things is the question of what do we do with, how do we relate to, and what is the role of painful experiences in life? Difficult thoughts, difficult feelings, difficult sensations. And do we define well-being predominantly in terms of the absence of psychological discomfort? Or more in terms of the willingness, perhaps the resilience, to be in the present sometimes uh, of psychological discomfort, not for its own sake, but you know, when it's helpful for us to do so, when moving our lives in a direction that matters to us means bringing some of our worries, doubts, maybe anxieties along for the ride. And this leads really nicely onto um, some of the work of uh, Decky and Ryan, um, particularly uh, prevalent, I think, their work in the early 2000s. They've uh, published a lot in this area. And I think the, the work that they're perhaps most well known for, one of the areas of work that they're most well known for is this distinction between hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna take a moment to um, uh, unpack or emphasize rather what each of those two schools of thought around what we mean when we talk about well-being emphasizes. So from Ryan and Decky's perspective, and I've provided one reference just down the bottom right there for you to kind of dig into if you want to. Hedonic well-being is usually defined in terms of positive, or should we call it like pleasant and appetitive kind of psychological content. We have a techie way of talking about it, but I mean like pleasant emotions, positive thoughts about the world and about ourselves, high levels of pleasure in one's experience, and conversely, the minimalizing of psychological pain and suffering. Um, we also see in definitions of hedonic well being references to kind of short term gratification, and you can see this starts to nudge maybe a little bit in the direction of negative connotations here, or at least potentially negative connotations here. Ideas about sensory pleasure and seeking sensory pleasure, sometimes, maybe sometimes without regard for potential negative consequences for others, for ourselves, um, uh, for the world around us. <coughs> Eudaimonic well-being, on the other hand, emphasizes something that I feel is really quite different. When you read into definitions of eudaimonic well-being, what we often find is ideas about searching for personal meaning, looking for ways of clarifying a sense of purpose, a sense of like what I want to be about in the world and how I strive to become uh, that version of myself. There's a recognition within this way of understanding psychological well being that resilience is needed to strive for that kind of self realization or self actualization, if you like. And that living a full and meaningful life connected to that version of yourself you aspire to be means going through some challenges, means bringing some challenges along for the ride, means not necessarily minimizing psychological pain all of the time. <clears throat> 
So these are two really, really different conceptions of psychological well-being. Almost like I think they're chasing two very different things. And I think it's fair to say that, that, that as I you saw know, from my own personal experience in reading around these two different definitions of uh, psychological well-being or, or, or leanings, if you like, in terms of how we make sense of psychological well-being, they don't appear to cohere particularly well. They don't sit with each other particularly well. You think about um, maybe the last time or, or when you asked a, um, a boy or a girl out on a date um, and uh, in the service, I don't know, of, I don't know, intimacy, social connection or something like that. And, you know, what comes along for the ride or what are you feeling before it? Probably not that many pleasant sensations, maybe some excitement in there, but maybe some anxiety, maybe some self-doubt, maybe some, oh, fear of rejection. Maybe what are they, am I going to, am I going to get rejected? What's it going to feel like? It's going to be so embarrassing. You know, those kinds of things show up in situations that we care about. Or for example, maybe you're sitting in an interview room going for a job that you really want to get or going for a, uh, applying for, a, for an academic course that you really want to get onto or something like that. And most people that I've spoken to, and it's definitely true for me in those kinds of situations, the mind races to all kinds of challenging places, anxieties, fears, self-doubt. I'm never going to get the job. The other applicants will be way better than me. How do you make those feelings go away? Well, kind of probably run down the road to the nearest bar and have a beer or something like that, you know, basically avoid the situation. But in those situations, there's probably something that matters to us driving us moving in that direction. And in order to keep moving in that direction, most people would agree, I think, that it also means bringing some difficult psychological content along for the ride, some of our worries, some of our anxieties, and some of our self-doubt. And in fact, <clears throat> whilst I wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination say that pleasant affect and sensations don't matter, of course they do in life. A life without joy or a life without uh, um, excitement and fun and these kinds of things doesn't sound like a great life particularly to me, but, and I think this is key, research over the last 30 years in the world of contextual psychological science and other schools of thought within psychology as well, have shown that excessively avoiding psychological discomfort, stress, worry, anxiety, and the like, tends to lead to lower well-being in the long term and poor life satisfaction on quality of life measures. So given all of these complexities, it's challenging for schools and it's challenging for us as psychologists as well to define well-being in a way that's clearly articulated, conveys meaning that is shared and there's a shared sense of ownership to uh, and buy-in across a school community is coherent rather than contradictory uh, or uh, even at worst incoherent and is workable in terms of it being linked to what we know from research about best practice to promote mental health and well-being. That's not an easy task to undertake. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to propose uh, a, a potential uh, way in which schools can go about defining psychological well-being that, in my view, does all of those things, is clear, coherent, uh, linked well to what we know in terms of what promotes the skills, the psychological skills that promote psychological well-being in us human beings. And it's called psychological flexibility. And I'm imagining many of you are uh, uh, fairly well versed in terms of your understanding of psychological flexibility. Um, and some may be uh, have had less exposure to uh, or, uh, and knowledge about psychological flexibility models. So I'm just going to say a little bit about what I mean when I talk about psychological flexibility. There are actually a number of different kind of visual model representations of psychological flexibility out there in the literature. For the purposes of today's conversation, I'm going to um, bring to the conversation the three pillars of psychological well-being um, that I think is a nice, uh, easy way of making sense of what we mean when we talk about psychological flexibility. The three pillars of psychological well-being are effectively a metaphor for three 
uh, three areas of skills, psychological well-being skills that we know from, again, 30 years of research or so within contextual psychological science can be incredibly helpful to develop and to build to promote our well-being and promote our resilience. Over on the left hand side here, we've got this openness pillar. So this pillar is about learning to relate in an open, flexible and skillful way to the world inside our skin, the world of our thoughts and feelings, to make room, if you like, for the full range of human experiences, for when it's useful to do so, our worries, our, uh, our anxieties, our uh, maybe uh, self-doubt, um, these kinds of thoughts, tricky thoughts and tricky feelings that might show up that sometimes might be difficult for us to work through. In the middle, we've got this awareness pillar. <clears throat> this is kind of synonymous with mindfulness practice, but not necessarily in the sense of like having to sit down, close your eyes and, and, and um, uh, be still and silent for a certain period of time, although you can, of course, shape up mindfulness and awareness skills in that way. This is about learning to mindfully relate to our experience, to when it's useful to bring an attitude of alertness and awakeness to our experience and to notice what we're doing, notice how we're feeling, notice what we're thinking, and notice how what we're doing is um, working for us and is impacting the world around us. And then over on the right side, we've got this active pillar, which in terms of psychological flexibility, kind of breaks down into two pieces. On the one hand, clarifying personal values, like the kind of person that you wanna be in the world, how you wanna show up in the world, who you wanna be. And on the other hand, uh, is about translating those values, translating those personal qualities uh, into action that brings uh, our personal values to life in the way that we go about living our life, in the way that we go about acting, interacting, uh, and conversing. So that in a nutshell is, is the psychological flexibility model within, uh, framed within the three pillars of psychological well-being. <clears throat> it's also worth saying that um, psychological flexibility is very much derived from this world of contextual psychological science and, uh, and to give a quick nod to Steve Hayes, Kirk Strosel and Kelly Wilson and other pioneers within the world of acceptance and commitment therapy and, and, and uh, allied models and um, resulting kind of interventions and technologies that have come from that world. Um, I would also say that it's more, if you haven't got this already, I expect you probably have closely aligned with a eudaimonic conceptualization of well-being than a hedonic conceptualization of well-being. But there is room in this model and recognition within uh, this psychological flexibility way of understanding um, human psychological well-being for some of the things that are emphasized more within a hedonic conceptualization of well-being as well, joy, consent, contentment, excitement, fun, these kinds of things. Um, I've never come across anybody yet, I don't, not knowingly anyway, who would say that a good life is about not having any of those things. Those things matter too. And it's also about making room for some of the psychological discomfort that comes along for the ride as we move our lives in the direction we want them to go. It's an inevitable part of uh, living a life connected to meaning and purpose and living a life connected to values that some psychological struggle is going to show up along the way. <clears throat> so thinking about psychological flexibility and how we might make sense of it and define it within a school context, I really like the idea of helping schools to define well-being in their own terms, perhaps with some support in understanding some of the complexities that I've been trying to outline over the last 15 minutes or so. But just as, a, as an offering to get us started, I thought I'd drop a, an example of what a definition of well-being could look like within a school community, such that they could then use that alongside a framework like the Public Health England framework and make sure that their practices targeted their own definition of well-being. So this is a, uh, a, 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 an attempt at 
uh, a psychological flexibility consistent definition of well-being that schools could use. All members of school communities exploring and connecting with personal values or qualities we most want to embody in our lives, bringing those qualities to life in our actions and developing an open, mindful and flexible relationship with our thoughts and feelings to enable us to do so. So you can see I've highlighted in bold um, the words that probably best link to the three pillars, values, openness and mindfulness. <clears throat> so at this point, probably for the last five, maybe six or seven minutes of the presentation before we open it up for questions um, and for any discussion that feels helpful to, um, to bring, um, I wanted to just circle back to our Public Health England framework and uh, say a little bit about how psychological flexibility models have developed in terms of the models, in terms of the interventions, programs, uh, curriculums even, um, uh, um, technologies more generally um, to help target this kind of conception of psychological well-being across the different segments of the Public Health England framework. Um, so we'll do that now. I'm gonna start with, you can see I've circled here, targeted support with uh, children and young people who are particularly struggling. So we're about two years into the most recent meta-analysis on the impact of psychological flexibility models on children's mental health and well-being uh, at the moment. The most recent one was published by Fang and Deng in 2020, and that showed 14 randomized controlled trials. Although I'd note there are hundreds of um, other studies in the published literature without uh, control groups showing impact from pre to post within subjects designs and some qualitative stuff as well. I know I put the plus two in there because uh, I peer reviewed two RCTs um, that are relevant to this slide since then. So I know, and they got three peer review. So I know there are at least two out there. There'll be more than that now because we're two years post that meta analysis, but that's the most recent one. 75% of um, psychological flexibility interventions um, out there in the published literature, approximately this, um, are uh, from one-to-one -one intervention programs and uh, the remaining 25% are group-based. There's plenty of stuff out there that's group-based as well. And generally speaking, what that meta-analysis shows is that ACT OUT performs non-active controls, treatment as usual conditions, and is generally comparable to uh, more traditional second wave CBT. And for those of you that aren't uh, aware of it, there's been a recent, I say recent, actually it's seven, seven years old now, but in, uh, in psychological model, in intervention model terms, maybe it's relatively recent still. Recent developments in the world of contextual psychological science have seen the development of a developmental or developmentally sensitive or developmentally informed version of ACT called DNAV, which was developed by Louise Hayes and Joe Chiroki. ACT has a pretty impressive evidence base also for supporting the well-being of, uh, or well-being in the workforce, well-being in the workplace, some of which also is uh, with uh, teachers and school leaders as well. There's over 20 RCTs in the published literature now demonstrating that ACT programs and interventions to support the well-being uh, of, uh, of workers, significantly improve general well-being and reduce work-related burnout. Meta-analyses show that ACT generally outperforms control conditions across both general well-being measures and work-related distress or work-related uh, uh, burnout measures. And yes, there's some methodological variability across different studies, of course, but compared to most of what I personally see taking place in, uh, in, in schools to promote staff well-being, this is a pretty solid evidence base. There's also some, there's a number of studies, actually, I've just cited one from us here, actually, but there's a number of studies out there in the research literature around psychological flexibility with, within the workplace that support the assertion that these kinds of group-based programs can significantly improve from a relatively small amount of front-facing time, actually about 10 hours across three or four sessions, can significantly improve general psychological well-being and reduce work-related burnout in senior leaders and teachers within schools. And it's also really exciting that ACT's increasingly being used as a coaching model within and beyond education. And I definitely refer people to John Hill and Joe Oliver's 
uh, book, Acceptance and Commitment Coaching, which is a really brief but really nice and accessible introduction to ACT as a coaching model. In terms of work with parents, um, perhaps not quite so uh, extensive as work in terms of uh, workplace well-being, but we do have a systematic review from the literature uh, that was published in 2020 that included 27 studies covering a really broad spectrum of presenting difficulties related to parent well-being. Some of those are RCTs, again, some of those are within subjects design without control groups, reporting on pre and post and some with pre, post and follow-up measures. But the majority of studies report improvements in parent reported, parent reported symptoms regarding child's psychological and physical functioning and parent reported measures of well-being, uh, self-reported that is, measures of well-being and mental health in themselves. And we have a really exciting, I think, <clears throat> area in which psychological flexibility models is beginning to extend now in the form of uh, school-based psychological flexibility curriculums. Myself and a group of colleagues here in Bristol spent most of the last five years developing a primary phase psychological flexibility curriculum called Connect PSHE. Website's in there if you want to go and uh, check it out for free. Um, and that's based on the Hayes and Cherokee DNAV model uh, that I mentioned earlier. Research, again, is very much in the emerging stages. And even though we've built PSHE, the Connect PSHE curriculum on um, what we understand to be the soundest scientific principles of children's psychological well-being, the research is at the emerging stages. Um, we have uh, 84 schools who are currently using Connect PSHE and a couple of studies underway, one of which is an RCT looking at the impact on children's well-being uh, across a six month period of exposure to Connect PSHE and one of which is looking at the uh, teachers experiences of delivering um, the curriculum. And then finally, there's this piece around doing psychological flexibility work with groups. So I've kind of coordinated with this with the ethos and environment piece up at the kind of 11 o'clock um, part of the Public Health England framework. So recent collaborations between psychological and evolution science has seen something happen that I think is really, really cool. Uh, and that is the development of something called the pro-social practice framework. And if you're interested in looking at um, supporting people at the group level in schools around uh, group cooperation, collaboration, and improving overall group functioning, I'd highly recommend um, uh, taking a look at um, the uh, pro-social book that Atkins and colleagues wrote back in 2019. The idea here is to use psychological flexibility technologies um, by which I mean, I just want to clarify that, perhaps it might be helpful to do that here, using values clarification processes, translating values into actions, and doing so in ways that are kind of mindful and aware. So those are the psychological, some of the psychological flexibility processes you see really at play in uh, uh, pro-social work in order to support groups in being more collaborative, more values driven, more productive and effective in the things that they do together. And all that within pro-social is framed within the uh, core design principles that Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for in economics back in 2019. And um, quick shout to my colleague, Owen Kogan, who's gonna come on to EP Reach Out sometime in the next few weeks, I think, to talk in more detail about uh, pro-social. Just as a very, very quick whistle stop tour today though, what pro-social effectively targets and how it makes sense of in slightly more detail, um, collaborative values driven productive groups is in relation to these eight core design principles you see on this slide. So developing shared identity and purpose, equitable distribution of costs and benefits, fair and inclusive decision-making, monitoring or transparency, if you like, in relation to agreed upon um, uh, behaviours and responsibilities, responding in a way that's graduated and sensitive to helpful as well as the less helpful stuff that we see people within the group doing, effective and fair conflict resolution processes, and also the authority to self-govern rather than to be governed in a way 
uh, that perhaps includes the exertion of unhelpful influence from groups external to the group, from other groups, and collaborative relations with other groups. So those are the things that pro-social targets. It's a really fantastic approach, and I think something incredibly relevant to our work in schools. So just to finish off the presentation, I guess I thought it might be helpful just to summarize what for me break down into four key points that I was hoping to make today. The first is the idea that whole school frameworks for promoting well-being really matter for schools. They help us to organize our practices. They help us to make sense of what we're <clears throat> possibly doing really well and what we're doing a lot of and what we're doing less of, possibly not doing so well and how we would know whether or not we're doing it well. Data collection processes, information gathering processes effectively. But for them to be effective, my position would be that schools also need to find a way of developing a clear, functional and coherent definition of well-being, uh, which provides this broad trajectory uh, or direction of travel. I would like to suggest that one broad coherent way in which schools could define and pursue well-being within their communities for children and young people, for teaching staff, non-teaching staff, parents, carers, for the whole community. I think the world of psychological flexibility is, is there now. We can offer this, is to adopt a definition strongly connected to this notion of psychological flexibility originally um, put forward by Hayes, Trosel and Wilson. And yeah, that's probably about it, actually. I've just collapsed the last two into one, haven't I? Which is absolutely fine, I hope. So thanks very much for listening. I hope it was useful. Um, there may well be things that come into the chat function now. Um, uh, I've left my um, uh, email address there in case anybody wants to get in touch to talk about uh, training, supervision options, resources, etc. as well as both of our websites. The Connect PSAHE website is for the curriculum. Connect Ed, uh, is the more the kind of mothership, if you like, for all things psychological flexibility and education um, that we offer as an organization, myself and my colleagues. So thanks very much. I hope it was useful. And uh, that's me done. I'm going to see if I can call Sarah back in. Um, and Sarah ask you, should I just open the chat function or would you rather just call some questions out at me? Which have you prefer? There, there are certainly a few questions in the Q&A box, Duncan, so we can have a look through. Uh, I don't know if you can click on them as mm -hmm. well. I can read them out. There's some comments and some questions, so it might be easier for you to read through. Mm. OK. So We're directed most people from chat, but I'll have a check on chat, see if there's anything else for you. All right. Thanks, Sarah. I'll... Um... I'll go through some of the Q&A questions while you're looking at the chat then, if that sounds okay. So one question is, uh, shouldn't the curricula, be, uh, curricula bit actually highlight the need to deliver all, including academic curricula in the manner that promotes uh, resilience and well-being, not just additions to the curriculum? Yeah, Simon, I absolutely agree with you, for sure. You know, uh, I wouldn't see, for example, the Connect curriculum as being something that should just be delivered for, our, for an hour or half an hour uh, during a particular week. I would advocate that the skills that we're trying to shape up within a curriculum like that should be um, supported and kind of uh, reinforced across the whole school day in lessons and outside of lessons. Hope that helps to answer that just a little bit. Anonymous attendee, I bet that's not your real name. Who gets to define well-being? When the definition is shared, who is sharing that understanding? Whose definition of well-being are silenced and subjugated as a result? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I do, um, as, I, as, I, as I said, I feel like it's really important to define well-being with a school rather than for a school. And I think also have well-being be defined by a uh, whole school as much as is possible and have a participatory approach to that. So the psychological flexibility offering, I think, is something that can be really useful to support schools in um, learning about 
um, and I think other models of psychological well-being as well. But I think it's much more powerful if schools can come up with these definitions themselves. And so I don't think we should land any definition, whether it's a psychological flexibility definition or any definition for that matter, um, on people and do it to them. I think it should be something which is more collaborative. Agreed. Uh, another one in here is around uh, what about some religious practices which may be arguably, which may maybe arguably suggest that pain, physical and psychological or emotional, has to precede any real joy? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure anything I'm saying is disagreeing with that particularly. Um, it's all relative after all. Feel free to pipe another question and I'm not sure I've completely understand what you're saying there, Simon, but uh, uh, I don't think I particularly disagree with the uh, suggestion. Vicky says, great session. Thanks, Vicky. Who was the author of the ACT coaching book, Duncan? So that's uh, Joe uh, Oliver and John Hill, J-O-N, not J-O-H-N. Um, uh, another anonymous person. So could you give an example or two of how psychological flexibility skills can be used in schools and education settings, maybe from a teacher perspective and a pupil perspective? Yeah, so um, teachers, for example, one of the things we've seen come up in our work to support psychological flexibility with teachers is helping them to clarify the kind of teacher that they want to be and how they operationalize that in their daily practice. You know, for example, um, teachers work under a significant amount of pressure, time-related pressure very often, and sometimes it can be really difficult to find ways of doing things that are connected to others. We're just trying to get it done as quickly as possible. But it's been really interesting hearing teachers' reports of doing this work when we do um, ACT and psychological flexibility work with them, come back and talk about how they're trying to do their lesson plans, deliver their lesson plans uh, in a way that feels um, uh, uh, connected to values, maybe the value of um, uh, creativity or the value of connectedness or something like that um, can be really empowering for them. So I think that's an example is helping teachers to go about their practice in ways that feel really connected to personal values. In terms of working with um, children in ways that um, promote psychological flexibility, I mean, there are so many different ways, it's hard to give one example, but what I do know is that, you know, children often learn at their best when they're outside of their comfort zones. You know, we talk about outside your comfort zone, out of your comfort zone and into your learning zone, right? So uh, stepping outside of one's comfort zone is in some ways a little easier when it connects to a personal sense of value about something you're trying to learn. And so, um, uh, so supporting young people in exploring their values and how their values relate to the things that they're learning can be really, really powerful too. And another thing I'd say about that particular success is I've um, had in my own personal practice doing psychological flexibility work with young people is that uh, uh, when we're working over on the kind of the left side of the three pillars, if we make sense of psychological flexibility in terms of um, the three pillars, that openness pillar. Openness is not just about being open to the full range of experience. It's also about learning to have a flexible relationship with our internal world. And part of that is about learning to see thoughts as thoughts rather than as literal truths. And so when we can help young people see thoughts that are particularly stingy, particularly tricky, difficult, fused, uh, maybe self-deprecating thoughts in a way which is just a little bit more distant, uh, a little bit more flexible, it can just help to create the space for them to engage in things that matter to them where before they were avoiding them, because even though it matters to move their life in that direction to them, it's painful to do so, if that makes sense. Sarah, what have you got? Anything? No, I think you've beautifully covered most of um, the questions there, Duncan. As always, uh, the value of giving and sharing when you come on. Um, so we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great and uh, I, I've enjoyed delivering and I hope people have found it helpful. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good start.